And there's got to be another way out besides just us versus them. But the way we need in the middle is family. I'll say more about that. This is another of my favorite books. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is one of my heroes. He's a martyr for the church. He's a Nazi resistor, not a perfect person. But he was struggling as a pastor and as a theologian for the church, to see the church stand up and be who it was made to be in Christ, rather than to sell out to who the culture, in his case, it was not in Germany, who the culture was telling them to be. And he came to the end of his ministry career, he had moved away from academics and he had turned into a pastor. And everything about the brotherhood he established in this underground illegal seminary was about him. It's a deep and heavy book, but it's very thin and loaded, and I would encourage you to read it. Another gap is the missional gap. Missional is a very popular word nowadays. But here, John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus says, after rising from the grave, his followers with him says, as the Father has sent me, he sent me. It's mission. And he also speaks to us through the work of John. As the Father sent Jesus, Jesus not only sent the disciples, but sent all his disciples. And he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. Acts 20, 24. That's what Jerry alluded to this one. If only I may finish the task that God has given me. Share the gospel of God's grace. There's a sense of urgency and of, of divine appointment. And yet we in church have a gap. What is that? I, I think this is going to be tricky, but I want to do this tenderly. Uh, Coming from a pastor's family, there are, there are soon going to be nine of us who are pastors in the family. We understand that everyone talks about us as full-time. But sometimes when we say that, our young folks, if they're not full-time, they hear that they are part-time. And as soon as that happens, they see that they are contributing to the work of God or following Him in mission on the side. We need to move into a discussion of, of vocation, of calling. Vocari is the Latin for, for calling, the idea of God calling specific people who are pastors to, to be pastors. But other people are also called by God into other areas of life. And what then we understand? So I don't want to, you know, this is not meant to be a legalistic thing that would defy what I'm, I'm talking about uh, in this whole presentation, but a sense of even our <laughs> Young folks who are going to pursue other careers are also able to serve. Amen? So what we mean by this, I'm going to pull down from another book. There are gestures and there are postures. And they, there's a quote here from Andy Crouch, the author of, of one book. All of these can be appropriate responses to particular cultural goods. And each of them may be the only appropriate response to particular cultural goods. Good. And a cultural good is what's happening in the world, not necessarily that it's good, but it's like a good or a service that the world is producing, um, like an iPhone, like the movie Noah, like the song Happy by Pharrell, whatever. But the problem comes when these gestures become too familiar, they become the only way we know how to respond to culture. And they become etched into our unconscious stance toward the world and become, instead of gesture, they become posture. What do we mean? Andy Crouch goes through four different approaches or relationships that the church has had toward the world and the culture in the world. Even beginning as early as the Protestant Reformation with Martin Luther, Andy Crouch is talking about pandemic. There was a time when, as Martin Luther did, the sale of indulgences and the abuses of the church, you need to condemn those things and stand on the word of God. It's an important gesture. The problem is, 
chicken becomes a tush, you see? We're always condemned. And the same then is true because after that, Francis Schaeffer and others, according to Andy Crouch, to go. Often they would critique the culture. They would look at it and say, you know, this is what is wrong. This is what is right. They wouldn't really get involved with it, but they would academically from a distance critique. That's a good thing to do. I'm doing that today with you. Not critiquing you, but understanding the gap in our ministry. And yet the problem is, good as it is as a gesture, it can be a problematic posture. You see the difference now, right? And then so on with copying and, and consuming. Like a gesture is if I say, hey, or if I go like this. But if all I do is go like this, or get stuck in a posture of this, it loses its effect, you understand. So where we are now, next slide, I think many of our young folks have developed this no longer as a gesture, but as a posture. And I think many of us, young or old, are guilty of perpetuating it as well. Consumption as a posture is capitulation. In other words, it's giving in. Letting the culture set the terms. Assuming that the culture knows best and that even our deepest longings for beauty, truth, love, and fears of loneliness, loss, death, have some solution that gets comfortably within our culture's horizons is only even important to purchase it, to consume it. Yeah. Many of us are stuck in consuming position. Whether it's experiences like young folks or properties like many older folks. Okay. It's a good thing. There's a time for that. I, I, this building is an amazing blessing. Can you imagine how many thousands of lives will come through preaching the gospel here in this church? That's a gesture. You have to buy this. You have to act on faith and pray like crazy that the Lord will provide a big campsite. 84 acres. My goodness. There's a time to buy that. But we don't buy everything. That would be a posture of consumption. And many of our young folks are suffering. And many of them learn it from us. It's just that they buy different things than what we are buying. So there's a term now called wanderlust. Many young folks who grew up in the suburbs, parents like many first generation folks, like my parents, they worked so hard to buy a home in a neighborhood with good school and send their kids to good colleges in order that the kids could have a better life than they themselves had. That is the gospel. I think there's so much gospel in there. It's, it's convincing enough. When young folks see their parents sacrifice, they know they are loved. They know that their parents' faith has something to love. But many of the young folks, well, I've already grown up having stuff. They don't see like eight-year-olds with cell phones. They say, what is that? Eight-year-old with a cell phone? I didn't even get a pager until I was 18. And that thing was huge and ugly. You know? But they have everything from a young age, and they have access to everything from a young age. So then when they get to a certain age to work and choose a, a vocation, if you will, instead of buying all the stuff, they've already seen that and had that, they might experience it. It's different. But the consumption is the same. The posture of buying is the same. When Paltrow made the news this past week saying, I think it's difficult when you, she said about herself as an actress, it's difficult when you have an office job because it's routine, you know, you can do all the stuff in the morning and then you come home in the evening. When you're shooting a movie, they're like, we need you to go to Wisconsin for two weeks. And then you work 14 hours a day and that part of it is very difficult. I think to have a regular job and be a mom is not as, of course, there are challenges, but it's not like being on set. Brennan Paltrow is a millionaire actress. Was a firestorm because she said that stay at home moms or regular moms who have office jobs, their life is easier than hers. We would all disagree with her. But many of us do the same when it comes to the mission involvement of our young folks. If they don't want to be pastors, they don't want to be missionaries. We look at them and say, well, what you're doing then, not as hard. 
it's not as much of a call. Here's what Andy Crouch tells us the posture that we need to develop, create. This is helpful. I think in our churches we have folks who are gifted and trained in many different ways. Not everybody will be a preacher. Thank God. We need some folks to put money in the offering too, you know? <laughs> There's three of us boys at home and the one in the middle, he's not a pastor. And I goes, oh, what happened to him? And we said, well, he's paying for us. We need that. Don't, don't, don't talk to him about calling. We need, we need him to, to pay for ours. You know I'm joking. But anyway. We can get our young folks involved, see, in living out the image of God, the creative work of God in Genesis, and he made people like himself, in a way. From any career, any field, any age. And I think we stifle what they could be doing for the kingdom of God when we don't allow them to be created. When the typhoon Hayan happened, I saw young people and people mobilize like I'd never seen before. Back in Chicago, we hosted a fundraiser. We raised $10,000 for World Vision. Obviously, it was November before there was controversy over World Vision. Uh, but you know, they reversed their decision and all that. There are there's an aspect of young folks that wants to find a way to contribute to the kingdom of God. But they need to do it in a way God has gifted them to do it. And we need to say that there's more in our thinking than just full-time workers and part-time workers. That we're all full-time for the Lord, but some people do it in this place or that place. That's when we move from one place up. Minimizing what's happening outside the church to seeing the Lordship of Christ over all of his creation. Abraham Kuyper said, there's not one square inch of creation over which Christ did not cry out, it's mine. That will get our kids on mission. In the end, I think about this question, what is discipleship for? And I had a big discussion with my deacons about this, and they were discipled by my father. They're excellent. They would, they would go to war, they would take a bullet for the pastor. But, I think what we need to understand is, what is discipleship for? It's for mission. Sometimes you say, we're doing discipleship for what? It's for mission. When they're engaged in mission, discipleship will happen. Because there's a, pur there's a purpose to it. We're training you so that you can go and reach folks. We're training you so that you can reach your office mates and your coworkers. We're training you so that you can uh, leave a legacy for the Lord. Not that we're just training you for church. Let's move. If, yeah. Next slide, please. Thank God. Can we get the next slide, though? Is that working? The fifth is the ethical. Yeah. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> Scary. Jesus is saying, ethics matter. Ethics matter. Did you notice that in every, every letter from Paul, he begins his letter with a greeting. And then he expounds what the gospel is in a way that they need to hear it in their context. And then the second half of the letter is ethics. Romans, for example, 
chapter 1 talks about here is the righteousness that comes by faith and then this is why all of humanity are responsible to answer to God he's revealed himself he goes on and says we're all sinners but there is a way to be righteous he makes that way in Christ Romans chapter 1 gets to chapter 8 and says 